Okay, Assalamualaikum, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good evening. So, um, we're just going to continue um, about HPLC major components. And then after which we will look into method development. And, um, and then that's it. Okay, and then of course you will have your um, tutorial that you need to complete. Um, so what I'm trying to, what I will try to do today is to um, try and make sure, um, I, I'll, hopefully I can finish by 7.30, okay? Because uh, I know you guys have um, alternative assessment with Tutor Mugunda, so, um, you know, I'll just try and finish as early as possible. Okay, <clears throat> so... Um, to just look at the uh, possible answer for last week's tutorial. Okay, so this is a tutorial. If you would like to analyze compound one and two, which detection method would, would you choose? Provide a reason with uh, with respect to the principle of the detector. So it's very straightforward. Um, so basically, uh, uh, we've looked at um, I think two different detectors. Um, one is UVBIS, even though it's PDA and, and whatnot, different types, but um, the general principle is one um, based on chromophore, the other one based on mass. Okay, so um, choose either one, and um, obviously you can choose mass spectrometry for both compounds one and two. Okay, so because MS is looking at the mass of the compound itself, so you can choose MS for both one and two, and two. Um, or you can just choose an alternative is um, MS for number two and oops, and um, UV this either uh, DAD or um, PDA for compound number one. Okay, so um, reason with respect to principle of the detector, just talk about the principle of the detector, how mass spec works, looking at the uh, basically for MS, the easiest answer is by looking at um, mass over charge ratio and the separation on the mass analyzer. And then from there, it will be detected. Um, um, the ions will be converted to the intensity and of electrons and will be uh, multiplied. Okay, so from there, you get a signal. So basic, simple, um, you don't have to explain like, you know, when, when I was uh, giving you guys a lecture, but that's the basic principle. As long as you cover the basic principle, it should be all right. Um, UVVIS, on the other hand, is looking at um, chromophore. So in this case, um, since number two is just a linear alkyl chain, um, no chromophore present, therefore UVVIS is not a good option um, to actually visualize um, that compound in HPLC. Um, UV yeah, or HPLC DAD. However, compound number one, due to the presence of um, um, unsaturated double bond um, or a benzene group, or even if you are focusing on the um, carb carbonyl group, okay, so you do know that this group absorbs UV. Therefore, you can actually use this for um, UV base. Okay, so basic principle. Um, you can also use the other detectors that was not described in the lecture, but it's um, written as your lecture note. So either is fine. Uh, but this one can be also used using ELSD. ELSD. Okay. So, or if you want to talk about some um, refractive um, index um, detector, so you can. Either is fine. Uh, I will just read through as long as it makes sense. Uh, with respect to the principle of the detector itself, you should be able to get um, easily full mark. Okay, um, that is all about tutorial three. Now I'm just gonna recap a little bit on the exam methods. Um, it will be conducted via Spectrum exam. So that's the link for Spectrum exam. If you have not um, accessed at all, you can uh, pretty much the, the, the um, UI, you, the user interf interface, sorry, the user interface is similar to no, our normal spectrum. Okay, so uh, it's just another platform that you, the university provides specifically for final exam. Okay, 
It will be a closed book exam um, on the 6th of November between 6 to 7 p.m. Okay, so it should be also on Wednesday. Let me double check. Um, oh, sorry, 6. Sorry, not 6, uh, 9th. There you go. At least I double check. So it should be on the 9th. 6 is on Friday. Okay, so it will be on the 9th of February, uh, 6 to 7 p.m. It is during um, in Wednesday, so similar to our kind of like lecture time slot. Okay, it's just that the exam starts at six to seven instead of five thirty. Okay, there will be twenty multiple choice questions. Um, either so the options are either um, you know normal A B C, okay, A B C D E. In that in this case, so you have five options or you have um say for example a statement so i've written a statement and then within the statement there's a box by which you need to click on the box and and choose the correct um words so it's more or less the same as a b c d e but this is just a drop down um, menu thing okay um or the other one is we have a sentence again with empty boxes and then with the options Okay, so option A, option B, option C, for example, and then you need to miss and match which one is uh, which. Okay, so there are three types of multiple choice um, questions, um, as I've mentioned just now. Okay, so each question will only carry one mark. Um, so over here, you have a total of 20 marks, and then you have two subjective questions with a total of 15 marks per question. So a total of 30 marks. So towards the end of the day, it will be 50 mark. And then plus, plus 50 marks that um, Dr. Magunda will give you as an alternative assessment, a total will be 100%. And this 100% will be marked down to, if I recall correctly, um, was it 70%? Okay, 70%. Um, so a total of 100 from Dr. Magunda in mind. Okay, and that will be the marks for your final exam. Okay, so for these two subjective questions, one will be short answer essay. So basically, you just type down the answers um, on spectrum exam. However, the second question will be a more problem solving question. Um, it's very difficult for me to try and um, you know to to have that particular question. Uh, specifically just by written um, so because this is HPLC there's a lot of spectrometric uh, question there's a lot of um, graphs so um, this question is more related to um, graphical whereby you need to do um, some drawing so I would request that everybody to prepare a piece of white paper um, a piece is, is enough um, you can have more but um, I've already tried and draw the answer and it actually fits in one piece of paper okay so one piece of white paper um, of course you need to make sure that you include your student ID um, on the paper please do not write your name okay so just include your student ID um, and then you can um, scan it using your phone convert it into PDF and I will prepare a link um, in spectrum exam for you guys to actually access and uh, it will open a google document uh, and you can submit your answers there okay but since the final exam um, you you are since for the final exam you are required to use um, browser lockdown okay meaning that during the exam itself you cannot use anything you cannot do anything with your computer so um to submit this okay so to submit the second question um what you need to do is you just need to submit all the answers first, and then you can uh, upload the um, the answer for that particular question uh, using the link on Spectrum Exam. Okay, so um, I will give you guys like more or less uh, extra uh, ten minutes to just try and submit this. Um, I do have a record when you submit the, um, the the other quiz, so make sure you submit the full quiz first a full um, test first before you actually proceed with submitting the final question okay so that i can have uh, a full time record when you actually submit your final quiz 
final exam. And then even if you do have a problem um, uploading the files and whatnot, we can always think about an alternative way by which you can submit either by WhatsApp or email and so on. Okay. But for now, the plan is for you guys to first complete the exam. Okay. Submit. Submit the other questions and then um, go back to spectrum exam. Spectrum exam. And then submit the last question. So uh, it will be question number, what was it? 22, 23, 22. Okay, submit question number 22. Okay, so this is the flow. Um, of course, I will remind this again um, next week. But so far, this is how you go. Okay. Um, so something that I need to remind everybody is that um, so far, when doing a trial um, final exam, so it's just a trial, it's not um, counted at all. It's just um, some questions that you need to answer and then perhaps you can submit something. So just trying to, uh, I'm just trying to try and see if the, um, the system actually works properly. Um, I found out that uh, this is based on another cohort of students. Um, there is a problem with um, trying to access Spectrum exam using an iPad. Okay, so if you, um, you know, the, the only computer that you have at home is an iPad, please let me know so that we can try and um, arrange something else. Um, and something else so far is for you to actually come to UM and use the computer available. Um, in the department okay so that is the only solution that i have so far uh, when discussing this issue with uh, my department okay so it's a very unfortunate um uh, especially for undergraduate students because some of them only have either an ipad or laptop uh, for you guys i'm not sure but you might be in the same scenario um, so if you do use an ipad as as the only mean of learning and um, that's your final exam, please let me know. Okay, just, just WhatsApp me now or later, then we, we, we can discuss about it. Okay, um, so please avoid using an iPad, that's one. And the second one, if you do not have an iPad and your means of learning is using a different tablets, Android tablets and whatnot, you, it will definitely not work. And yes, if you do use the tablets uh, for learning, you will be the same scenario. You'll be, you know, um, under the same issues with uh, people who are using an iPad. So let me know, um, and um, from there, hopefully, we can uh, figure out something. Uh, you know, figure out the the problem. Okay, and finally, um, I will provide a practice tutorial next week. Um, hopefully, uh, well, by then, uh, you will not have any other assessment other than the ones, um, the, the final tutorial that I'm gonna give you next week. Okay, so that's the last one. Um, therefore, uh, th again, this is just a practice, okay? A practice in a sense that uh, I'm hoping that everybody can spend a little bit of time to go to Spectrum exam and then um, really try the um, mock exam, okay? So if you do have any problem, then at least you know beforehand. And um, of course, if you do have any problem, you can discuss with me. So we, we will try and um, solve the problem before the, the day of the exam itself. Because if it's on the day of the exam itself, I might not be able to help you at all. Okay? Because I need to invigilate as well. Uh, I might ask Dr. Muguna to help. But um, yeah, but you know, he, he already did his uh, final exam, so to say. Okay? All right, so the practice uh, next week, the, the marks will not count to any of either your continuous assessment or your final exam, okay? So this is just a pure practice um, for you to try and see if the system actually works. Okay, so that's all for final exam. Um, if you do have questions, you can just stop me now. Um, otherwise, I will just continue and try to finish the lecture by seven o'clock or 7.30. Doctor? Yes? Do we need to turn on the camera during the exam? No. Okay. 
So for your final exam, the only requirement, uh, the, the minimum requirement the UDC sets is for you guys to use uh, what they call as a lockdown browser program. Okay, so um, during this practice trial, you will need to install the program already before you can actually um, do the trial. Okay, so um, I do know some people has problems with uh, internet connection, the speed of internet connection. So I am not enforcing everyone or all my students who are taking an exam with me to open the camera. So the requirement is for you guys to use the lockdown browser. So this is what I will force um, because otherwise you cannot enter the exam anyhow. So just use the lockdown browser um, and um, I'm just hoping that you guys are honest enough to not actually look at all the lecture notes uh, to actually you know, solve the questions. Okay. Any other question? Uh, doctor, I want to ask about the last uh, question about the uh, uh, right in the white paper. Is it we need to, when we scan the result, uh, our result, and then uh, let's we need to email and then open the email uh, in the spectrum exam. Can we open our email? Yes. Okay. okay. So um, for this particular question, okay, as I mentioned, you need to complete all the other uh, quiz, uh, all the other questions first. Okay. You make sure you have completed the other question and then you need to submit. So without this one, of course. Okay. So just leave that one blank. It's fine. The question will be there, but just leave it blank. Um, and then once you have submitted everything, so this first submission, once you have submitted everything, then the lockdown browser will turn off. So you can now access Spectrum Exam. Okay, so the link will be provided on Spectrum Exam specifically for that particular question. Okay, so you just click on the link on Spectrum Exam. It will open a Google form and then you just submit your uh, file via Google form. Okay. Okay, okay. All right. Any uh, other doctor? Questions? Yes, Baba. Doctor, after answering the MCU questions, right, uh, we can uh, change the answers for the previous questions again, right? Yes, yeah. you can. So okay, until you. before you uh, press the first submission, then you can freely go uh, between questions and whatnot. No issues. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, doctor? Yes? Uh, currently, I'm using a Microsoft tablet. Is it affected also? Microsoft tablet. Um, is it the, what do you call it? Um, there's, there's two types of Microsoft tablet. Is it the full version or the, what was it? Um, RS? RC? Hybrid. The hybrid, See? it can be like, yeah. Okay. So I don't think you have an issue because it should be a full fledged, um, laptop. So this trial, okay. The ones that I'm going to open next week will definitely tell whether you can or you cannot uh, use it, but, um, since it's a Microsoft, I think you should have no issue uh, assessing the final exam. Okay. Okay, anything else? No? Okay, all right. So we'll just continue just uh, a little bit on lecture four, um, looking at the last two components in just a few slides. Okay, so we've looked at pretty much um, all the components that I've listed down here. Okay. We will not look at uh, display because it's more towards the software version. And since nobody is actually in UM, so it's a bit difficult for me to actually show it since I also need to be in UM. Okay. Um, but anyhow, um, if you actually um, search for uh, modules, HPLC modules, then you might be able to get like more than um, what is listed here. So the basic minimum that um, I've selected is nine okay, because some of them are actually kind of like a sub component of the other ones. So yeah, I'm just going to focus on this nine. So you do have to, if you are the type that um, reads a lot, um, trying to, you know, enhance your knowledge, which is good, but um, it will not be covered in the exam. Okay. So just focus on this nine. We've covered uh, one until six um, column, uh, which is last week. So today, oh, detector is last week, sorry. Um, and therefore, what we're going to look today is just going to look at either to um, recycle your compound or um, to just, you know, throw it away in a waste, a waste bin, a waste collector, or 
to uh, and and to actually look at the bus module. Okay, just a little bit. So component number eight, uh, waste or recycle, which is collection, and this is what I've also talked roughly uh, in the beginning of the HBL um, in in this course with me, of course, not with Mr. Mugunda. So um, on the figures on the right hand side, this is just showing you some different types of auto collector. So this one is a fraction collector. If you look at that, uh, from Waters, while the ones on the left is from Shimazu. Okay, so the the differences are very minor, as you can see here. There's a lot of tubes for collection. Similarly, that is the tube rack for collection, and you can see that there's an arm, uh, motorized arm over here as well that moves around and. Um, elute um, a certain volume of, um, of, of illusion from HPLC, the ones that you separated, okay? So basic principle is um, it will collect what you want it to collect, okay? Um, so uh, I've written here, hardware control based on sample peak, okay? So it, it, you can actually control it um, regardless of what, um, manufacturer you actually choose from so um, all so far so far that i've known all three major um hplc provider which is waters shimazu and agilin they all have the same uh, feature which is you can set so that the system auto collects your sample of interest based on the intensity meaning the height of the peak so uh, say for example if your peak height is um, 1000 um, milli AU. Okay, so if you want the system to just collect above 500, then you can set it so that it will collect only 500. So, uh, why do you want to collect above 500? Because sometimes if you collect it um, at the very end, um, at the very beginning or at the very end of the peak, you might get uh, a mix with another compound. Okay, so sometimes you just want to get. The, the very uh, top of the peak so that you can be sure, you can really, really make sure that the system collects the most pure compound, okay? Because sometimes you have something like this, right? So if you, and then if this one is uh, one, uh, 1,000 milli AU, okay? So if this one is 500, if you start, if you ask the system to start collecting above 500 what you will get is you will collect here until here okay so from there you can positively say that you get the uh, most uh, pure fraction okay while even because if you collect it from the beginning then you might have a slight over, uh, overlapping peaks from the previous peak or you might have something like this okay so it's a broad impurity so you might collect it a little bit first when you do your mass analysis or um, analytical analysis then you might get like a, you know slight impurities okay all right and also you can set it to uh, collect based on retention time so meaning if this one is five minutes and then 10 minutes so you can actually set it so that it will collect based on time so it will collect from here up until here well of course if you do set it um, based on time points, thus you uh, you might get a slight mix between your pure sample and some of the impurities um, at the shoulder of the peak. Okay, and so there's three types. So one is you just collect it based on purely on intensity. Second one collection purely based on retention time, and the third one is a mix of two. Okay, so you can set it so that please collect at above 500 uh, milli um, AU and at the same time collect it above five minutes. So what the machine will do is kind of like doing both. So as long as the scenario um, fit into both criteria, then it will start collecting. Okay. So in this case, for example, it will just collect um, similar to based on intensity, it will collect everything. But in case, um, say you ask the system to collect everything above 500 milli AU, but the retention time, you want to set it from one minute to say at the end of the um, run. So it will collect every single peak that is above 500 uh, milli AU. 
Okay, so those are the um, kind of like types um, system setup that you can actually um, request the, the whole system to do. Okay, or alternatively, you can always do it manually. Um, so to do it manually, pretty much you just follow through the column. Um, so exiting from the column, it will go to the detector. And then from the detector, if you recall from last week's lecture, detector has two holes. One hole is solvent going in, and then another one is solvent going out. Okay. So to collect it manually, you can just simply take the um, outlet uh, tube and then straight away collect it into a test tube. Okay. So that is the manual ones. Um, I've done all of this before. Uh, I did a manual collection as well um, since some of my compounds previously was um, not really uh, chromo, like, like not really absorbing uh, wavelength at the most common uh, wavelength that we use. So um, I actually collect everything manually so that I will not miss even a single drop. Okay? So again, it depends on your sample size. If you have a lot of sample, then you do have some leeway to uh, actually either use time or just based on intensity and whatnot. Okay, because if you just based on it, if you do collection just purely based on intensity, then definitely um, you still have a little bit of compound on that particular region. And this particular region, if you just do it based on intensity, definitely you will lose your, the, the compounds. Okay, so depending on how much you have as a raw material, um, you can either just you know, forget about it, uh, put it in the waste, or you can actually collect it. Okay, so um, with regard to the auto collector uh, or fraction collector, one special consideration that you need to think about is um, the delay volume from the detector itself before it actually reaches the um, robot arm uh, for the collection. Okay, so this length connecting, if this one is a detector, okay, so the length of this void volume needs to be taken into consideration and you need to actually set it up in your system so that you can clearly identify um, when to start and when to finish okay so this is an example uh, we we have this um uh what do you call it volume written here okay um i think this is my handwriting a long long time ago i can remember okay um, but yeah so you need to have the void volume put it into consideration um, unless, of course, if you have a lot of sample, then you might not need to care. But uh, if your sample is very precious, especially um, in this lab, because we are doing a lot of synthesis, so you don't have enough, sometimes you don't have enough compound for uh, final purification. So knowing this volume will actually help us to um, collect every single drop containing a product. Okay. All right, so this is just an example of a fraction collector. Um, you might, of course, this is not it, but um, the blue line can represent the cut off based on intensity. Okay, so that anything above it will be collected. Okay, so this is just another figure um, to kind of like replicate um, what I've just said uh, and draw in the previous slide. All right, and let's look at the last component, which is the bus. Okay. So um, the bus is pretty much where the traffic controls, uh, the, the traffic between the software and the hardware moves. Okay. So the bus system connects in to the all other modules and then connects to the computer or the, in this case, LC rotation. This is the software. Okay where it will transfer the information, uh, transfer the data. Okay. So an example here uh, that I've chosen, small as the same, um, the difference in bus highly depend on the uh, manufacturer of the whole system. So you cannot simply take a Shimazu system and then connect it with um, waters. Uh, probably the old waters, yes, you can, but the newer ones, normally they, they need to be um, connected uh, in such a way that towards the end of the day, the information can be transferred to the software because the activation comes from the software instead of the module itself as what have 
um, been done previously. So the older generation ones, yes, you don't really need to care whether um, the software is connected properly or not uh, because you can always, you know, you can see here that there's buttons. Okay, so there's, of course, this one doesn't have any buttons because this is just a module. But for the pump, um, um, for the Shimazu pump, okay, so Shimazu has more or less the same structure for each module. And you have a display over here. Okay? So um, even if you don't have a software to actually connect all the module, so with just a bus, you can actually manually control the pump flow and whatnot. So the older system, you can do this without any software connection. So the buzz at that point, is not really critical, but nowadays um, everything is software activated. So without the software, it will not connect and you cannot, you cannot actually run it properly. Okay. So the important thing is for you to use the same uh, bus module uh, per manufacturer. Okay? So you cannot just take another one and put it in. Um, and the second one is for you to know the limit for your module. Okay, for this module, uh, Shimazu module, it can connect up to twelve modules. So imagine if you have one pump auto injector, um, pump auto injector. Uh, we just keep oven because oven is not critical, and then you have a detector. Okay, and auto corrector. So you have four modules. That's the minimum. A D guesser. Okay, you have five modules minimum. So this Shimazu bus can connect up to 12. So what you can do is you can actually use one module with two systems. Okay, so this is possible. And from here, when you actually start the software, you can actually select whether to open one software for this module and another one software for another module. Okay, so this is, um, you can do it. Uh, so this is why I want to talk about bus. Okay, because you can have two sets of HPL system using one bus module. Okay, so two channel for analog data can be connected for acquisition. Okay, so um, that's the maximum, two system per unit because acquisition data, analog data is based on your detector. So one module, at least for this module, for the current ones that I've found is um, only suitable for two HPLC setups. Okay, Agilent, however, um, if I recall correctly, the software itself allows until, what was it, six different HPLC connecting to the one uh, similar software. You uh, can't remember whether it requires one module per HPLC setup, but you can actually use one workstation, one um, computer to actually control six different HPLCs. Okay? You can, but again, um, towards the other day, because the, the software setup is based on um, the LC system, so it might be a bit difficult for six person to actually use it simultaneously. Okay. All right. So that is all for um, our lecture four um, and for the introduction of major HPLC components. Okay. So what we will do today is, uh, or not today, now, is for you guys, um, we, we're going to have like a live tutorial. Okay. So because so far, all the tutorials are take-home tutorial and you just do it on your own. There's only one question, a very simple one, or probably two. So what I'm going to do now is just for you guys to look at uh, how the question setup will look like. Okay. Of course, we'll see the same thing um, next week. But um, this one is more like a live feedback so that I can actually follow through whether you guys actually uh, manage to grab the concept that I'm trying to figure out. Okay, so um, if you can, um, you don't have to. We, you do not have to register with any website or whatnot. You just take your phone, okay, and go to this web address, polf.com forward slash hadith for art zero four nine. That is listed at the very top of um, your screen. Okay, so if you go to that web address, uh, polf.com forward slash hadith for art zero four nine from your mobile phone, you can actually you should be able to um, see. Uh, this question. So I'm hoping that you guys can uh, participate a little bit because otherwise before this lecture is just about me talking, now I would like to have a little bit of participation from you guys. Okay. All right. So you do have to put out your names and whatnot. Um, wait, why is it showing a different question? Let me see. 
Okay, there you go. Now it's a proper question. Okay, so can I please have um please have some uh, answers? Okay, manage to get one. Um okay, two. Okay, so this is just kind of like a little bit of feedback. Um of course all of this feedback depending on um the feedback that I will get soon, probably soon. Um need some revision, but okay. So everybody is doing um needing some revision. Okay. Um but oh, there's only one, seems like. Okay. We have how many in the group? We have about 20, 20 person. So can everybody participate? If if I can request that everybody participate, would be nice. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. So I'll just give you guys like a few more seconds. Um, yeah, probably I'll just open my watch. Okay. A uh, few more seconds. Now we have about twenty five. Okay, as long as I do not see any no in the middle, then uh, I would say it's good. Um, because at least I know you guys do have the background a little bit on um, chromatography. Okay. All right. So I think that's all. Let's move to question number one. Oops. Question number one is, module Z is highly affected by temperature change. What is most likely the module? So if you look at the um, image there, you have four options, A, B, C, or D. Why is it not everything? Okay, there you go. Okay. So uh, module Z is highly affected by temperature change. What is most likely the module? So um, kind of like you know, live feedback for you guys. So which one do you think is module Z? Okay. So we have A over there, uh, B, C, and D, which is which is highly will highly be affected by um, a temperature change. Hopefully, you recall what each and uh, every component is. Okay. Of course, um, your final exam will not be as difficult as this because of something like this you need to understand um you need to memorize this picture specifically and the arrangement so you will not get some a question like this obviously i will um, at least detail out or show you guys um at least you can read the module right because as you can see this is a shimazo module and shimazo module normally have a name uh, per module uh, written on the system itself. So normally it's written somewhere around there. I, I cannot draw it. Okay, so how many responses have I received? Mm, it's like my internet is a bit slow because it's raining heavily outside. Received 14 responses. I think that's enough. Okay, so um, if you look at the question properly um says that module z is highly affected by temperature okay so it's um, affected by temperature the keyword there is affected so if you think about a b c and d so a is just um, some reservoir um, not really doing anything um, the function is just to store solvent so definitely a is um, not the answer i'm looking for okay b is a detector okay b is a detector so just get IV for a while c is the um oven column okay column oven um probably i'm sure you guys selected c because you might think c is specifically the column itself so the column might be affected by um temperature and d is the auto collector so obviously auto collector is also not affected by uh temperature so the answer can be either B or C, but in this case, the answer that I was I was thinking about um, is B because B is the detector, 
So detector will definitely be affected by the change in temperature. Okay. However, C, it depends. Um, yes, if you like do the both extreme, then definitely um, it will affect the column, the separation of the sample. Uh, but the module itself is not affected by anything. Okay, so um, it's, it's just a module. It's, it's just a trick question um, for you guys to just think about. Um, but yeah, I'm not going to do something like this in your final exam. It's too cool. Okay, so let's look at question number two. So question number two, HPLC can also be used to separate and analyze metal complexes, true or false? HPLC can be used to separate and analyze metal complexes. Okay. Um, refresh it a little bit. I received 14 answers already. Okay. All right. So I think I'll stop here. Then when I'll be, I'll leave it until I change to the next question. All right. So to answer this question. Okay. HPLC can be used to separate and analyze metal complexes. The answer is true. Okay, you can actually analyze metal complexes. Um, even you, you might not be able to do it um, using um, what do you call it UV this, but you can um, analyze metal samples, uh, metal complexes. For example, using uh, MS. Okay, so MS is looking at the mass so metal has a mass therefore you can actually analyze metal complexes using hplc okay so the answer for this one is true okay uh, question number two now question number three oops column efficiency is highly affected by dot 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 so uh, more than one answer is possible so this is just um, just key in your own answer. What do you think uh, column efficiency is highly affected by? So most likely column type is uh, one. Column type, you have polarity, you have temperature, okay. we have uh, mobile phase, Yes, so column type is getting bigger and temperature is getting bigger. So length, yes, is also correct. Mm, gradient, definitely. Okay, so as you change the gradient, then uh, the separation will be different. So it will affect the column efficiency. Flow rate, also yes. Um, what else? ID, internal dimension. Uh, internal diameter, internal dimension, internal diameter. Um, true, that is also correct. So the smaller the ID, normally the more efficient the column is. Okay. Uh, what else? Particle size. I've seen particle size. The support type. Yep. So basically the type of material. Okay. So pretty much you you know the um answers. Okay. So um so far what I've seen here. Are all correct. Okay, so excellent job remembering our last two lectures. Okay, I'm gonna stop now. I'm gonna start activity in question number four. Okay, question number four. Oops, what happened here? Which of these is best for analyzing non comma force uh, molecules? Oops, what happened here? Let me see. Oops, why is it going to question number five? Okay. Which of these is best for analyzing non chromophorous molecule? So, UV VIS, uh, photometer, ELSD, uh, PDA detector, reflective index, none of the above. Just refresh again and see how many responses. We have 11 responses so far. Have eleven. Anyone else um, wanting to have a guess? 
I have here 11 responses. 13 now. Okay. All right. So the correct answer are, so it's R, not is. The correct answer are two. So you can use ELSD and also you can use reflective index. Okay. So why can you still use reflective index? Because reflective index is looking at the density of a molecule. Okay. The density of a solution. So as long as um, your sample actually dissolve in a solution, then of course you can get a different in um, solvent density. Therefore, it will affect the reflective index. Okay. So there are two answers here, ELSD and reflective index. So what does ELSD do? Um, ELSD does. So what it does is it actually burns the sample. And looking at the, um, what was it, uh, temperature or heat, wait, is it temperature? Heat, temperature or light, I can't remember, of a burnt sample. So uh, if, say, you have uh, a molecule, a small molecule like a benzene compared to um, a naphthalene, okay, ubat gagat, naphthalene is very big, the, the molecular structure is very big. So the energy content uh, between these two molecules are different. Okay, so this is how ELSD measures. It measures, it burns the sample, and then from the burnt sample, you can actually uh, measure the concentration of that particular sample. Okay, uh, concentration, and of course, you can see a peak height. Wait, uh, I can't remember whether they can measure concentration or not. Um, ELSD, it cannot directly, but if you do have a standard plot, then you can. Okay, so, but um, either or, you can uh, use both. Uh, which one is the best? Um, of course, it will be a reflective index. So RID is the, uh, I would say, the most sensitive uh, equipment uh, detector. However, the disadvantage of it is that um, it's very sensitive. Thus, if you have a, a current issue, current as electricity, not, not current now, current electricity, so electricity issue, um, if you have problems with your solvents, so it will definitely be reflected in your RID. So you might get a, a high background reading instead. So there's, there's a lot of optimization that needs to be done before you actually use RID. So um, there is a summary in a, a research paper saying that before you actually use RID, um, on average, you need to spend between one hour to two hours to make sure that the background noise is, you know, really gone before you can actually run your sample. So in comparison, if you actually use the LSD or UV this or PDA detector, very straightforward. You can just um, run the system for about five minutes. As long as the baseline is flat, you can, you can, you can just straight away um, deliver your sample and see the response. Okay. All right. Question number five. Um, these scenarios would affect reproducibility of HPLC except, okay, so which of these scenarios can affect um, HPLC? There's five options, either column heating, um, removing the gas module, um, using different mo mobile phase, inverting column, or none of the above. So this scenario will affect, uh, I think this one is not um, none of the above. It should be all of the above. <laughs> okay, all of the above. Probably that's why nobody actually answers this. Okay, so um, my, my bad, my mistakes there, it should be all of the above instead of none of the above. Um, okay, so we'll just skip one number six. But of course, um, you can affect if you change the heating of your column, then of course it will affect reproducibility. So if one day, on day one, you actually use room temperature, but then in day seven, you actually heat it up to about 35 degrees Celsius, then you can see the retention time will be shifted. Okay. So removing the degasser module, of course, if you remove the degasser module, then you might have um, bubbles forming inside your system. Therefore, will affect your uh, pump, it will affect your uh, if the bubbles actually went through until the detector, okay, so it might affect your detector reading. So, of course, number one, number two is correct. Number three, using different mobile phase. Of course, definitely, if you change from one mobile phase to another one, you will definitely change um, the reproducibility. 
Okay, so the results will be different. Um, simple case is if you use 10% esonatrile, isocatric flow, compared to in the future, you use 50% esonatrile as isocatric flow, then definitely you get a different in the um, spectrum. Okay, and of course, inverting your column will also affect your uh, reproducibility um, because the column itself, um, if you, you just purchase the column uh, as brand new, then perhaps uh, in two scenarios, they, they might not differ that much. But um, say, for example, the column has been used uh, previously and then you invert it, of course, um, you will get um, different um, spectra peaks altogether. Okay? So there's various reasons that we will look at uh, next week. All right, number six. This would influence sample uh, separation in a column except. So type of material, chemical interaction, physical interaction, shape of column and length of column. So which of these will affect sample separation in a column? Or which will not affect? Okay, so instead of which will affect, which will not affect because I have except over there. Okay. Um, I get anything else here? So nine responses so far. Um, nobody selecting anything else, so I'm pretty sure everybody knows. Okay, so um, the shape of the column does not influence the um, separation. Okay, so you can have like a zigzag column as long as it was meant to be like that. Then of course um, it will be like that. Okay. Of course, the shape of the column can actually influence. Uh, imagine if you have a U-shaped column like this, so you can, uh, and it's a, a big in diameter. So sample traveling at the outer edge, outer edge of the column will definitely um, be purified in a different manner. Okay, so because the distance traveled by the solvents, uh, by the solute, are now different. But if you have a column like that example where the total distance are more or less the same then you might not see uh, much differences okay but otherwise everything else will definitely uh, will surely affect sample separation okay and number seven in chromatography which of the following can be uh, can the sample type be so um, solid or liquid liquid or gas gas liquid and all of these so which one do you think are the correct answers the correct answer okay. so again which of the following can be the sample type so when you um pretty much the question asks what can you analyze in hplc what type of sample that you can use to actually analyze in hplc so the the sample can only be solid or liquid or a liquid or a gas, or the sample must be a gas, the sample must be liquid, or all of this. Give you guys a few more seconds to figure it out. I have 13 responses so far. Okay, let me see. Um, I have one more last question before we can actually, uh, we will move to the lecture. All right, so I think that is all. Okay, so for question number seven, um, the sample type can be any. So it can be a solid, it can be a liquid, or it can be a gas, provided that, as I mentioned previously, provided that um, in any of this uh, state of matter can dissolve in your mobile phase. Okay, even if it's a solid, if it can dissolve in mobile phase 100%, like 100% soluble, then fine, you can actually uh, separate them in a column. Of course, you need to look at which uh, compatibility in terms of the column, uh, detector and whatnot, but in general principle, you can use solid uh, as long as it's dissolved. Liquid, uh, of course, you can, but um, the take is that it needs to be miscible. So if your liquid sample is not miscible in your solvent system, then you need to find a different solvent system to make sure that it's uh, dissolved properly, okay? And gas, uh, of course, um, yes, gas perhaps you can say uh, GC is the best, but LC, MS, well, technically you can still analyze the content of gas. 
um, especially if you can dissolve the gas in HPLC and um, as a dissolved gas. Okay, um, so this is one approach by which um, environmental chemists use to analyze volatile organic compound VOC. If you have never heard about it, okay, you can you can search for it. Volatile organic compounds. So VOCs are compounds that evaporates um, rather quickly, and you can actually analyze um, the VOCs in HPLC. Okay. The only perks is that you need to first trap it in the solvent system before you can actually run it. Okay. And the last one, choose the best answer. Liquid chromatography and HPLC differs in option number one, speed per sample run. Option number two, efficiency of separation. Number three, sensitivity to identify sample. Uh, four, ease of operation. And five, all of the above. Okay. So what are the main difference, main difference between um, a normal LC and HPLC? Right, I have 13 responses now. Probably a few more seconds. Till I get 15 responses and I will stop. 15, 15 responses. 15 responses. All right. Oops. Okay. So that is the last question. Um, for this question, which one choose the best answer? LC and HPLC differs greatly in um, speed per sample run. That is also correct. Okay. Efficiency of separation, that is also correct because one is using high pressure, another one is just using either um, an ambient pressure or slightly elevated pressure. Sensitivity to uh, identify a sample. Yes, of course, HPLC has um, a specific detector modules that you can add and it's actually missing in LC. Okay? So even though LC can be attached to uh, a uv uh spectrophotometer, for example, but um, HPLC can be attached to MS, which can be a very, very high sensitive equipment. Okay. And of course, ease of operation, because why? Once you set it up once, you can just keep on asking the machine to you know, run multiple times non-stop. Uh, in comparison for LC system, you uh, need to make sure that the solvent um, on the reservoir is always there. So it's more hurdles, so to say. Okay. So HPLC is... Um, better in that sense. Therefore, I would say the best answer would be all of the above. Okay. All right. So that is all for um, a bit of practice. So let's move on and look at lecture number five, which is uh, method development. Okay. So what is the goal for this particular lecture is um, just to provide you guys an overview on how um, HPLC method development um, are done. Okay, of course, for those who have used HPLC, then this is kind of like a repetition a little bit. Um, so it's more for those who have not used HPLC uh, previously. Okay, so how do you actually met, uh, develop a method? But if you have not used HPLC, but you have used GC, it's more or less the same, but there are differences bit and pieces. Uh, for example, for GC, you need to make sure that um, your heating temperature is um, uh, higher than your sample uh, boiling point because otherwise it will not fly and you cannot detect it at all. Okay, uh, HPLC, we do not need to have that particular section. Uh, what's important is for you to choose the correct um, mobile phases um, and make sure the, the mobile phase is compatible to your sample. Okay, as long as you uh, got the uh, compatibility right, then there's no issue in running HPLC. Okay. Uh, and we will also discuss a little bit on, uh, well, discuss is meaning that, you know, for me to just describe it. The approach for initial method development. So to look at how do you set a column, detector, a mobile phase selection, okay. Um, to method optimization to improve resolution. Um, perhaps this one will be covered more on the next uh, week lecture, okay. So we will look at more on 
what are some common problems and um, how do you troubleshoot to increase the resolution and whatnot. Okay. And finally, uh, emerging method development trends. Um, um, can't remember what is the trend that I'm, I'm I've written here, but uh, nonetheless, we will look at how um, pretty much this is mostly how I figure out what to do um, when I have a new sample that I need to analyze. Okay, so it is more it's more kind of like a guide for those who wants to start from zero. If you are working in an analytical lab whereby you keep on analyzing um, similar samples. It might, be, it might not be uh, identical, but it might be similar. So for you, it will be like slightly different. You might have a different opinion, but uh, this is how I teach my student um, how to actually, you know, decide on what to choose from, uh, how to, what, what to look for before you actually um, set up your HPLC. Okay. So the, the focus is on reverse phase methods uh, for quantitative analysis of small organic molecules. Since reverse phase accounts for um, a huge percentage of usage, okay. So, for example, in pharmaceutical, uh, for in terms of chemical, there's a lot of analysis in environmental. Okay, as we have heard um, last year and the year before, there's a lot of um, um, what do you call it, uh, river contamination. Okay, sudden river contamination, and especially in Selangor, Malaysia. Okay, uh, and of course, in cosmetic, you do need uh, mostly use a reverse phase HPLC to actually analyze the, um, the product component. Okay, especially if you are interested in doing um, similar products, so you might take uh, a competitor products. You want to analyze what are the ingredients in there, uh, and then you can replicate uh, and sell it as your product. Okay, either you improve it or you do a turn down version or similar vision, but at a cheaper cost, okay? So we, um, not to say it's a bad practice, but um, it's kind of like bad, so to say. All right, however, before you develop a method, okay? So developing and validating new analytical methods is costly and time consuming. So this is something that you need to know. So if you want to work with a new sample, then you need to think about one is the cost, and the second one is time. Okay, it consume. It might consume again. It might consume. Doesn't mean that it will. It might consume a lot of time, and it might increase the cost. Okay, so these two are related. So the more time you need to spend in developing your method, the higher the cost. Okay, the cost can be the um, human capital cost, meaning that if you are working in a company and you spend a lot of time trying to develop a method, then of course because the company pays your salary. And if you work, uh, if you try to develop a method within one month, then your salary is just focusing on this particular area while um, you might be hired initially to do multiple tasks. Okay, that's one. Uh, cost, human, human cost. Second one, ingredient cost. This is more, um, more common. Okay, as you develop method, you need to change a lot of um, either gradients or um, separation time. So uh, these all involve using a lot of solvents and therefore you can increase the uh, cost of um, the run. Okay. So just to give you guys a few examples. All right. So a uh, thorough literature research should be conducted for existing, uh, to look for existing methodologies and intended analytes for similar compounds. So this is the best practice. So instead of um, starting from zero straight away or from scratch zero at all um, it might be better for you guys to actually do a little bit of search okay so we do have uh, nowadays we have uh, mr google that can help you to just quickly search uh, research material okay research paper so either google scholar or um, if you do have access to web or science especially now because you guys are all students you do have access to web or science so you can try and find the information from where our science okay from there um, look at the uh, protocol section um, especially if you're doing a more an analytical so you can look at the the uh, analytical and do a, a matching uh, based on what you have what system you have what solvents you have and to the system that is uh, being published okay 
So sometimes doing literature search is the best way as a start. So instead of doing uh, bare zero, you can do, um, can start off like, you know, instead of starting from A, you might start with from Z or, or sorry, from G or H. Okay. But uh, if you discover something new which have not been published at all, then definitely you will need to start from zero. Okay. So this should include uh, computerized search of chemical abstracts and other relevant sources, monograph, um, journal articles, manufacturer literature, and internet. And nowadays, um, manufacturers uh, also publish a lot of data, okay? especially the manufacturer that produces column. Um, they do, um, do they, they actually do a lot of research in uh, doing a comparison between um, their old column or new column, or perhaps a competitor column and their new column. And then from there, yeah, they actually show you which one is better and worse. Okay. So uh, it's a good way to start do a little search. Oops. Now it's not changing to my different slide. Oh no. Sorry guys, technical error here. Let's keep that for a while. Okay, so these are the steps or strategy for developing method. So the first one is to define a method and separation goal. So um, define a method, meaning that either you want to use a reverse phase or uh, a forward phase and stuff like that. So there's, there's a few things and we will look at in more detail after this. Okay, and then once you have decided um, on the separation goals, uh, whether you want it to be like 99% separation, 100% separation, no overlapping peaks at all and stuff like that, okay? And then once you have decided on the pre-data, you need to gather information on the sample and the analyte. So what are the sample of interest that you want and what are the analyte, okay? And of course, from there, you also need to look at the solvent compatibility. So solvent sample A might not be compatible with the current solvent um, that are published, for example, okay? And of course, you will need to match that with your column. Okay, so some columns are suitable for both reverse phase and a normal phase, but some columns are more suitable for one uh, mode only. Okay. So once you have gathered all the information, you know what you what your run will look like, then you will do an initial method development, a scouting run. Okay. So you just do all your basic setup, uh, either based on literature search or just do a random zero to hundred percent um, gradient or isocratic. It's up to you. Okay, just to get the first chromatogram. Okay, so the first chromatogram is very important because once you have the first, you can do modification and uh, depending on what you want to separate, then you, you can try and uh, try an error, so to say. Okay, then once you have your first chromatogram, you will fine tune it and then optimize it until you get what you want. So if initially you have a five peak like that, and then this is the compound of interest, okay? So you might want to um, do a lot of fine tuning and optimization so that perhaps so the other day what you get, you get something like this, and one big peak, something like this, and like that, okay? And this is still your peak of interest, okay? So it depends on your goal um, and how you want it to be, okay? So once you have this, um, say, refined method and it's already optimized, what you do next is you do method validation. So method validation is basically a different terms of rerunning the whole thing. So just rerun and see if you can get the same spectra. Okay. So why is it important? One, because we need to make sure that uh, the retention type of a peak of interest is always the same. So it's uh, reproducible. And the second one is you don't want to have a setup that will leave your column dirty. Okay? What do I mean by that? Uh, perhaps you have one compound which are very polar and you are using a reverse phase column, C18. So you know that the compound will have um, a high, high interaction uh, with your column. So it will stay in the column for longer period of time compared to the other molecule. So you don't want at one point when you keep on running the same sample and suddenly what you get is you, you get one big huge peak here. Okay. So this is what we call as what you'll see next week is what we call as a ghost peak, suddenly emerge or extra peak. Okay. 
So without any reason, it's the same sample, it's the same solvent, it's the same um, method runs, but suddenly there's an extra peak. And so the extra peak can actually come from the, your column, why, uh, whereby the um, um, illusion of that particular sample are re really slow that after you run multiple times or a second run, um, the peak now becomes obvious. Okay, so this is the strategy. And now let's look at the strategy one by one. You have about uh, 50 more minutes. I'm pretty sure I can finish before 7.30. Okay, so step one. So um, looking at define methods and separation goals. So how do you do that? Uh, methods is basically you need to think about whether you want to do a qualitative method or a quantitative method. So whether you want to just look at the quality of your peaks or you actually want to quantify the amount of sample in, in your peak. These two are different depending on what you want to do. A qualitative method for me, uh, normally for something that is raw, meaning that I have not purified. Um, so I might be interested more on qualitative. So the, the quality of the synthesis, for example. So I have I might have a few different um, synthesis that I'm doing concurrently. So I want to do a direct comparison. But I don't I don't need to quantify the yield yet. I'm just looking at whether um, the byproducts being produced are a lot or a few. Okay, stuff like that. So it will be more uh, qualitative. But once I have chosen um, one method, I want to see whether it can produce a high yield or not, then it will be a quantitative. Okay? So qualitative method confirms the presence or absence of a certain analyte uh, by matching ret retention time with a reference standard. Okay? As I mentioned, you just want to see whether it's there or not. If it's not, then it's good. Or if, or if it's there, then it's good. If it's not, then again, it depends if if it's not there, but it's for the byproduct, then it's good. Okay, so UV spectral data from photodiode array are often used um, as a secondary confirmation technique. So regardless of how you want to uh, do it, um, normally UV vis is the other secondary confirmation data. So what do I mean by that? Um, this is largely based on um, pharmaceutical research. Okay. Um, and based on synthetic, of course. So if you synthesize something, um, you might do LCMS. You look at the mass, the mass says, oh, it's, it's there. So you want to do a confirmation, then you might do a secondary confirmation or uh, using a PDA, okay, an example. This type of method can be um, a limit test to evaluate whether the level of analyte is above or below a certain present limit or to generate a chromatographic profile of comparative purposes, okay. So to the end of the day, you kind of like just, just to try and see how it will look like so that um, in the future, if you want to change something, then you can do a comparative, whether the yield is increasing or decreasing as in, also as I mentioned. Okay? So this image down here, it's more suitable, suited for this particular um, section. If you recall, I've, talk, I've used this figure before. Okay? So you can see here chromatograms of um, a fruit extract, um, red, and chromatic, chromatographic standard in blue. So that one is the standard. That one is the extract. Um, and you have internal standard, uh, volatile dehyde, and this and this and this and this. Okay, so um, those are the standard. And you can see here because blue is the chromatographic standard. You can see um, as long as they are the same, then you know they are the same compound. Again, chromatographic standard doesn't need to be uh, at the same quantity because towards the end of the day, um, you just want to see whether it's there or not. Uh, you can have both quantitative and qualitative runs, uh, but you know, again, depending on what you want to do. Um, and uh, from here, uh, an unknown is being um, shown or detected. And from here, this might be a compound of interest because um, you might have, either you don't have the standard for that one or it can be of interest for whatever reason, okay? Right, so the second one is quantitative method. Let me change slide. Okay, it's to generate information on the concentration 
all amounts of, of analyte in the sample. Okay, so this is where um, normally if you do a UV vis, what you do is you do a standard, you, you prepare a standards at a, uh, a certain concentration, okay, and then you measure the absorbance, and then if you have an unknown, uh, an unknown sample, okay, what you do is you just rerun and see where is the concentration, and then from the uh, plot of the graph, then you can actually determine the concentration of that particular sample. Okay, so this is a, a more standard uh, for HPLC. What you can do, of course, you can do the same thing, um, but the beauty is the concentration is um, reflected on the area under the curve, especially for UVVs. Okay, uh, for mass spec, uh, yes, it depends on the mass spec system. You can have um, the what do you call it? CIP um, count. Um, count for intensity CPI. I can't remember. So you can pretty much you can get the the count, the number of molecule that is being detected by the mass spec. Okay, so from there you can actually relate back to concentration. Uh, either it might not be an absolute concentration, it might be a relative, but nonetheless, uh, it's a concentration. Okay, so system calibration typically using external standard or internet standard is required. Okay, so it's more or less the same, but instead of preparing one by one you can actually just prepare one standard okay, at one concentration, uh, one mole per liter, for example, or a two concentration, uh, two standards, so it's two mole per liter. Okay. And then what you do is you ask the system to inject um, at various volumes. Okay, So based on the volume, you can actually know the number of moles, um, and then you can actually draw your plot, graph plots and whatnot and see um, to make sure that these two concentrations that you've prepared have an overlapping peaks. Then you can have like a very, very nice um, standard curve. And then from there, you can actually um, determine the concentration of your analyte. Okay. A quantitative method is more difficult to develop and requires extensive uh, effort of validation. Okay, now. Why does it say it is more difficult? Because um, if you are actually going into analytical chemistry and um, trying to develop a quantitative method, you need to do a minimum of three tests, okay? Uh, three sample tests, three, uh, meaning it's the same sample, but you need to do a three tests at three um, different times. To so say, for example, in week one, you did three analysis of this sample. Week, week two, you did another three samples. Week three, you, you, you are doing another three samples. And then from these three samples, you need to calculate the standard error, variation between samples, um, influence of solvents. And there's, there's a lot of things that you need to actually take into consideration before you can really, really say that the method that you use is a quantitative method. Okay, So a lot of standards. Um, of course, if you have done it previously, um, especially if, if your machine is being calibrated um, according to the time scale that it needs to be calibrated, then you might not need to do this three experiment at three different times. But nonetheless, validation is very important. So um, it's best to actually do in a three different time points instead of just doing a one time point, but a hundred um, similar sample. Okay, so three different time points is better than running um, three runs um, in the same day. Okay, so variation between days are also critical, and that is something that um, analytical chemists actually uh, really look into. All right, so analytical method goals are often defined as method acceptance criteria for peak resolution, precision, specificity, and sensitivity. Okay, so um, per, per your first run, um, so you need to make sure that all of these are actually reasonable. Okay, otherwise, this sometimes sometimes there's no point or um, to actually run it, or you might need to do further optimization. Okay, so for example, pharmaceutical methods for potency assay of an active pharmaceutical ingredient or API. Okay typically require the following. 
a resolution of greater than 1.5 from the closest eluting um, components. Okay, so resolution meaning that the peak separation must be more than 1.5 um, distance wise. Okay, precision of retention time and peak area. Okay, so less than 1 to 2 percent RSD, uh, standard deviation and linear in the range of 50 to 100 percent um, concentration. Okay, so th there are a lot of um, features um, that needs to be taken into consideration. Okay, so analysis time uh, normally between 5 to 30 minutes, uh, less than 60 minutes for compact samples. You normally don't go beyond because again, um, if your company is doing an analysis and if you need to take like three hours for one sample uh, to analyze one sample, then it's a waste for the company. And of course, it increases cost. Okay. Second one, minimal sample workup. So um, again, this is just uh, a basic strategy to reduce cost. The simple work, um, the better. Okay. So the easier the work that you need to do before you can actually before you actually can run a HPLC is better. So say for example, if you have a sample from a river, um, you know what you want to analyze, and the only sample prep that you need to do is filter it through. 0.1 micromolar filter, micrometer filter, okay? An example, it's a very simple workup. If you do that, and you be able to analyze, I'm not sure what you can analyze, uh, perhaps a VOC or um, metal concentration, for example, okay? So the shortest, the better, the easiest, the best. So extract and inject sample, uh, inject if possible, okay? Extract um, extraction, LLE, for example, liquid liquid extraction is very easy. Uh, SPE, surface, uh, surface, uh, surface solid phase extraction is also very easy. A simple um, you know, injection through a filter is also very easy. Okay? Robust method that does not require extensive training for execution. Um, of course, uh, this one is especially true for a company that has a high, um, what do you call it? Uh, turnover rate of your members, okay, your staffs, high turnover rate of the staff, then you might want to develop a more robust technique um, so that, you know, the, the methods are, well, nowadays it's not a big issue because all methods you can actually save, uh, but previously it's, it's more uh, difficult because um, you need to optimize the system and uh, there's a lack of software that can control all the modules from one interface. And finally, low cost per analysis. So um, again, costing, you want to use um, low concentration of reagent. Um, you want to make sure that your instrument is as cheap as possible. So uh, for example, even though you can attach LC, HPLC to NMR, but if you can uh, do the same thing using HPLC attached to a DAD, then you might opt for the DAD, okay? And of course, uh, setup cost, as, as I also mentioned, okay? setup cost can also be um, including on the sample preparation and whatnot. Okay, step number two. So gather sample and analyze information. This information is useful for selection of appropriate sample preparation procedures as well as initial detection and chromatographic modes, okay? So as I mentioned previously, either a positive uh, or either a normal mode or reverse phase mode, okay? Initial detection, you need to make sure that you can detect your sample if your sample is chrom uh, chromophobic. Chromophobic. Um, it's a chromophore, okay? So you can detect it, uh, but you need to consider the concentration itself. If your sample at low concentration has the same um, absorbance as your just a blank solvent, then of course it's not a good um, setup, okay? a good method. Chemical structure of the analyte uh, furnishes data on molecular weight and the nature of the functional groups. Okay? So molecular weight uh, affects the, um, the data that you might get. Okay? So uh, for example, if again I, I were to compare between a benzene, which is which still has a um, conjugated double bond compared to a naphthalene, which um, has two um, benzene ring attached to one another. Then of course, uh, naphthalene has a higher molecular weight. 
and then it can actually reflect on um, the structure itself. The, basically, the higher the molecular weight, you have a higher chance uh, of the, uh, a more sensitive reading. Okay, and the nature of functional group, of course, functional groups depending on what is the functional group, um, you might need to use different detector methods. Okay, if you only have, for example, an uh, alcohol group which is normally what you see in the carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, um, for example, what is the pressure? Glucose, okay? So the function group is always uh, alcohol. So of course, if your function group is just OH, you cannot use UVVIS. So you might want to use a different technique such as RID or LSD, okay? Particular attention should be directed to acid-based aromatic reactive functional groups from which estimates of pKa, solubility, chromophoric, and stability data can be inferred. Okay. So um, you, if you do know this, so acid, acidity and basicity of your molecule is uh, important, especially to um, make sure that your column is in a good shape always. Okay. So if your sample are on the extreme end of basic, um, meaning it can be a Lewis base, for example. Okay, so it might not be good for a common column that you use that doesn't have all the other technologies to reduce um, damage to your column. Okay, so again, it depends. There's there's a lot of uh, variables that you need to consider, uh, but these are some of the consideration uh, with regards to your compound. Okay. Aromatic, so if you have aromatic, then the easiest way, the cheapest uh, setup is uh, UVVIS. Okay. If you have a reactive functional groups, then you might need to either deactivate the functional group or uh, adjust the pKH or adjust the pKa so that it is less reactive. Okay. So why do you want it to be less reactive? One is you don't want your sample to actually damage the column. And the second one is you need to make sure that um, it does not, so it, it, well, reactive here can also mean that it can easily decompose, okay? So you don't want your sample to be decomposed uh, in the sense that you synthesize it, you run it, and then you detect something, but to the end of the day, that is not the compound that you um, detected. It might be a decomposed uh, product or a byproduct or an oxidized product and stuff like that, okay? It might be still good, for a simple analysis, um, because the byproduct might be an indicator of your compound actually exists. But if you do that, uh, then you cannot use uh, auto collector to actually purify your sample using HPLC. Okay, so give and take. Right. So as in pKa, solubility, chromophoric stability, it's it's more related to what I've mentioned previously. So stability is more on. Um, reactivity, chromophoric, uh, it's related to aromatic. So you, you do have the uh, function groups or the structure of molecule that can easily absorb light. Okay, so that's the easiest way by which you can do your setup. Um, solubility it, uh, plays an important role depending on the um, molecules, whether it's acidic or basic. Okay, because um, an acidic compound uh, dissolves better in a basic uh, solvent and vice versa. Okay, so um, that is something that you need to think about. So MSDS should be uh, should be gathered if available to develop appropriate guidelines on safety handling procedure. Okay, so this is another thing as a chemist, you need to always uh, review MSDS to make sure that whatever you are doing are um, proper. Okay, and of course, safe for you, not for the machine. You don't have to care about the machine, but at least it is safe for you. So these are common sample preparation procedures. Just, just an example, um, if you have a solid, so um, the sample prep can involve grinding, milding, homogenization. Pretty much you, you want to crush the sample um, to reduce, uh, to, to make sure that the particle size is small. So that will uh, facilitate in extraction. Okay, So that's one thing. Or uh, facilitate in solubility. Now, second one, uh, extraction. So you can extract using sonication, shaking, soft light extraction, LLE partitioning, SPE. So there's, there's a lot of other methods. So you can just read through this. It's very self-explanatory. 
Okay. Um, um, and I think that is all for this slide. Okay. Self-explanatory, I'm hoping that you guys can just read through. Okay, so this is an example of um, solvent compatibility. Okay, so if you look at here, um, if you are trying to develop a new method for HPLC, then these are the things that you need to consider. Okay, you need to make sure that um, the X, I would say, oh, sorry, the Y and the X are miscible. Okay, so if you look at this table, so the, the dark blue is immiscible, meaning that if you are trying to uh, develop a system, a gradient system using cyclohexane and isotonitrile, it will not miscible. Okay. What, what it means by that is that it will form like two layers is, and it will, it will form emulsion. Okay? So especially in a high pressure system, if you actually do mix them together, you will form an emulsion and emulsion is very, very bad for um, your column pretty much. Okay? So this is just a guide. Um, of course, you might change it accordingly uh, depending on um, the cost itself. So uh, for reverse phase, normally it's water and trial, And as you can see here, this one is miscible. And why do you want to use water? Because water is a cheap source. Okay? Even though um, HPLC water is not as cheap as we think, but um, in the wrong run, it is roughly cheaper than the other. That's, okay? You can also use ethanol, which is uh, cheaper ones. But again, if you want to use ethanol here, you might need to use an absolute ethanol or ethanol that is um, not spiked with anything else. So towards the end of the day, um, you need to think about the compatibility, pH, and um, whether mixing between these two solvents create temperature or not. So then temperature will affect your separation. Yeah? So there's, there's a lot of things that you need to figure out. Um, and it, definitely you need to test it first before just simply chuck it in into the HPLC. All right, so initial method development. During initial method development, a set of initial condition. So you just pretty much just set up anything. So whatever you have, you just set up with one run. Uh, of course, it needs to be compatible. If you have a column, uh, the column, if it's a reverse phase, then it needs to match with the mobile phase itself. And of course, um, depending on what you want to measure, then you need to have a compatible detector. Okay. So that's why I put it here, put it here, one, two, and three. You need to make sure that you just need to set a detector. You need to set a column, and then you need to set a mobile face. Okay. And then you just run it so that you can get a scout a chromatogram, just a rough chromatogram. And from here, it can be, oh, okay. So um, to set this initial condition, it can either be a random trial or again, following a published uh, data. Uh, in most cases, it has based on reverse phase C18 UV detector okay, in general. Of course, it's not always, but in general, it is. Um, a decision on developing either isocratic or gradient, so I look isocratic gradient, can also be made at this point. Okay, So some compounds, you just want to do it isocratic, it's enough. Um, some might not, towards the other day, depends on the resolution. The bet, uh, If you can get a good resolution, Using isocratic, then be my guest, use it. Um, well, I found that one disadvantage of isocratic is that you still need to once in a while do a gradient wash, because otherwise there might be some uh, impurities or byproducts that actually um, stays for so long in the column before coming out. Okay, so this uh, isocratic is one of the um, general source where you can get ghosting peak, ghost peaks. Okay. So detector selection, as we've covered, so there are various uh, detectors that you can choose. Um, depends on the budget that you have. Okay, so this is just an example. Um, if you have these three scenarios, what would you choose? Okay, so uh, it's the basic ones. I will just skip. So basically, these three scenarios is uh, you have three different samples, and then these three different samples have uh, different UV uh, absorptions. So what would be uh, the UV, uh, the wavelength that you, you need to use for your detector? Okay, so pretty much what you do is you need to first get, um, uh, what do you call it, a spectra 
uh, resorbance. So at varying wavelength, and then from there, you can find the lambda max, and then just use the lambda max. Um, one of the lambda max, of course. Okay. But sometimes um, you don't see a lambda max, then you can choose the next best highest. Okay. So that's one. Or second, uh, sometimes what happens is that you choose the lambda max, but again, you need to remember that um, if you use a UVVIS, okay, it is based on principle of uh, B. Lambert law, and therefore, there is a limitation on your absorbance. Okay, remember, B. Lambert law goes something like that. So as you increase your concentration, okay, absorbance, you will reach a plateau down there. Okay. Sometimes it's not really good to just simply use lambda max, especially if you have, uh, if if uh, you will reach your plateau at a very very low concentration. Okay, it depends. It's good if the sample that you want to analyze are very very low in concentration. Okay, so again, these are um, that's why you need to do uh, optimization uh, and fine tuning because to the end of the day. Um, you know what you want to investigate, whether it's a high concentration and so on and so forth. So you can still uh, change the well, wavelength that you want. You don't always have to use um, lambda max. Okay. So these are um, guidelines on a mode selection. So if you have a micromolecule of a molecular weight larger than 2000 or less than 2000, so analyte types, either organic, Polymer, biopolymer, or polar. So this one can include proteins. Okay. Or for lower than molecular weight, then normally you have medium polarity, of course, depending on your function groups. Okay. Mostly, most likely is more largely non-polar. Or it can also be ions, ionizable, or ionizable compounds. Okay. So uh, common mode is GPC. Mm. Gas phase uh, chromatography, um, we can have SEC, reverse phase chromatography, ion exchange, helic, um, HIC, RP. This is a combination of two, NP, helix, and so on and so forth. So there's, there's a lot of uh, methods that you can actually choose from. Um, this is just a general guideline. Okay. So once you have generated um, first chromatogram and what you need to do next is fine tuning. So, an uh, example of a case study, a method goal is to develop MS compatible composite method combining assay and impurity for drug substance. This pharmaceutical active ingredient API is a basic salt with a pKa of about eight, good solubility in water, especially under acidic uh, condition and UV spectrum, as shown in the left. So, we have two ways um, by which you can actually. Um, do fine tuning and whatnot. Okay, so either you use a gradient option or an isocratic option. Okay, so this is just the uh, basic um, UV absorbance for the API. So let's look at the um, gradient illusion first. So we can use C18 column and uh, broad gradient. So how do we actually generate the first chromatogram? Well, pretty much one approach is for you to just simply run. 0 to 95% acetonitrile in water, okay, at a certain percentage, okay, or 0, or 0, to 0 to 95 percent acetonitrile in water, meaning that the, the um, other solvent that you use is water, okay, so this is the solvent system. So you can just do a, a scan, so this is what I normally just call a scan. So you just run everything, and then from the scan, you can actually identify uh, what is your API, because normally API is either you synthesize it, so if you synthesize it, it's the, normally is the highest concentration uh, from the um, UV uh, spectra. Okay? So in this case, um, you have about 5.9 uh, minutes uh, at the highest um, absorbance, okay? and you do see and smaller peaks at different other uh, retention time. Okay, so from here you know that nothing is valuable above fifty percent. Okay, so 
um, that one is gradient profiling. So if you roughly that one is about like fifty percent, okay. So you do know above fifty percent, there's nothing important, okay. So from your first run, you can actually say, okay, the second run I can perhaps do a gradient like this. So you start with five until fifty percent, and then straight away you go up. Um, to 95% in like 30 seconds or so. And then um, you can see here the wash phase is very short, about two minutes. Then you can do two minutes um, of 95% ECN and then straight away back to 5%. So if you do something like this, now what you save is you save roughly about um, eight minutes. Okay, so this is why um, generating the first chromatogram is important. Because to the end of the day, it can save you time. So not just save you time in, in the sense that you want to do something else after it's finished. Uh, what it means is that, say, for example, if you're a company that does a lot of analysis on one specific compound and you have millions of millions of compounds, not millions, it's too much, uh, perhaps uh, hundreds of compounds that you need to run per day. So if you save about eight minutes uh, per run from 20 minutes, you, you go down to about 12 minutes then you can have more samples to run per day. Okay, uh, basic, very basic straightforward. So, um, gradient illusion analysis of absorbance as variable wavelength. Now, so at the same time, what you can do is um, from your first chromatogram, you can have a DAD uh, detector. So, if you do have a DAD detector, what you can do is you can actually look at um, the absorbance at varying wavelength and then from there you can kind of like choose what would be the best uh, absorbance wavelength that you want to use okay so say for example if you look at here to uh, 210 if you look at this one four three two one so 210 the absorbance is very very high up here but during the peak separation itself it almost reaches the perhaps the limit of um, detection for that particular system okay so normally limit of detection can go depending on the the age of the system um, normally it's between two and above then you will start to see the plateau on uh, based on the beer lambert law curve okay so um, if you want to use 210 nanometer um, you do know that if your sample is in scarce quantity, then perhaps it's the best option. Okay? But if the sample uh, should be a high quantity, then perhaps you want to either choose to 20, to 30, or to 60. Okay? That's one thing. The second thing is that um, if you use a different wavelength, you can now see another peak emerging. Okay? So from here, you do know that uh, that's your peak of interest. It's pure. But now you do have another peak, an impurity. So it's a good indicator for you to use 260 in the future so that you know whether the impurities are there or not. Okay, the impurities might be something else, it might be, it might be something of interest, or it might be nothing. Okay, but knowing that you can see impurities there can be a good sign. Of course, it can be a bad sign if you are trying to do something else. But um, for me, I would say uh, the presence of impurity shows that um, especially if, if you only see one impurity for the, this particular wavelength in comparison to a different wavelength then you know that you need to do something else to make sure that if you want to purify this then you need to make sure that 260 is one of the wavelength that you will look into okay um 230 for example it's not um well from here you, you can see that it looks good okay you only see one peak However, what you do see here is there's an increase in the baseline. Okay, so the reflective index is increasing. Um, so if there is a small peak um, coming out below the base, baseline, now it is no, it's no longer observable. Okay, so therefore, um, and this one is going negative. Going negative is still okay. Um, so there are multiple options that you can choose and to the other day, there are multiple things that you need to consider before I actually say that this wavelength is definitely the best, okay? Of course, if you have a, a PDA, 
there's no issue you can just always run and um, we can always analyze uh, your um, wavelength your, your sample analysis at any given wavelength all right um, so and then once you have analyzed your uh, best wavelength for your detector and then you do know that um, the sample eludes at about 30 percent what you can do next is you can adjust the gradient range so that you will just focus on 20 to 60. so previously i mentioned that you can reduce it from five to five to um what was it 50 okay but now you can also make it shorter at the front at the very beginning okay but the issue with changing from the beginning and the end is that you need to kind of like um, gen regenerate the first chromatogram because now um, the, the peak separation will definitely be different than the original one altogether. Okay, so but why do you want to do this? Again, you can either save time, uh, but also you can actually get a better separation if you change the gradient. Okay, so that is also possible. I've seen uh, some of my sam uh, samples are actually better at being separated if I do not start from zero or five percent, but rather I go into a higher concentration and then um, go from there. Okay, so again, there's no one method fits for all, so that's why it's always best to go to the literature and then try and find the um, related information. Okay, so isocratic flow. Um, it's more or less the same thing, but instead of using an isocratic um, having gradient, what you do for isocratic is just simply choose one concentration and then just run and see how it goes. So that will be your first um, chromatogram. And then from there, you can either play around, um, either increasing or decreasing the percentage, depending on how the peak looks like. Okay. So for example, over here, if say you run all these four, 20, 25, 30, and 35, you can see that at 20% ACN, the peak becomes very broad. Okay, so meaning that the separation is a bit slow, is a bit uh, sluggish. So uh, this is definitely not a good option if you are to do uh, a quantitative analysis. A, a, a quantitative, okay. A qualitative, perhaps, is still okay, not too bad, because from here you can see, oh, my product is there. But again, a broad peak may also indicate a smaller uh, peak underneath the big peak, which is might be a bad sign. Okay, so you go into twenty five. Um, not too bad. Now it's getting better. Okay, and of course, if you look at the retention time, now it's fifteen. You know that it takes a long time. You move to twenty five. Uh, it becomes like slightly more than three minutes. So you go into three um, uh, percent ECN. Now it becomes even shorter, but here you can see there are peak splitting okay, and it's very close to um, in the injection point. And then you go to 35%, it becomes very neat, very be beautiful, but um, so at the end of the day, you are not sure which one, whether um, this one overlaps with your injection peak or perhaps 35% is gonna try is already high enough that um, your samples and your um, your sample of interest and your impurities actually eludes at the same time. Okay, so the other day you might need to still play around and get the best out of it. Um, if I were this guy, I'd probably go um, try and see like in between. Um, and perhaps I normally start with ten percent and then ninety percent, and I go down about twenty percent until I'm uh, mid in the midpoint, about fifty percent, and then from there I do a comparison to look at uh, how many impurities I can um, get, um, what is my pre, uh, peak, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, what are my peak heights? What are the retention time? So there's, there's a lot of things that um, I do consider before actually running uh, isocratic. But so far, I normally do gradient because gradient is uh, easier, uh, even though uh, isocratic as you can see here, might actually save a lot of time. 
So as a critic reaction, choose the best chromatogram that gives you the best resolution. Okay, so peak separation, make sure you have two, uh, two peaks that are easily identifiable. A good symmetry of a peak so it doesn't go, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, broad, uh, either it's a broad peak or uh, a peak that goes, um, what's the technology? Oh, I can't remember the technology on, on top of my head. Okay, a peak something like this, um, as, as I've shown previously. And uh, you need to have a balanced um, retention time. Okay, so not too long because too long increase solvent costs, increase running time, electricity, and whatnot. And of course, you, you too short also might not be best because some people might say, how can you be sure that there are no um, overlapping peaks underneath the peak of uh, interest? Okay. So towards the end of the day, you do need to have a few more runs um, if the rotation time is too short. Okay? So best to use additional detector or method to validify purity, then that will be best. If you have a UV and LSD, you put it in and definitely you can do a comparison between um, the two methods and say whether your methods um, set for HPLC are, are the best or you can actually improve it. Okay. So additional info on fine tuning or what to look for. Okay, so of course, uh, as you change the solvent, as you change the column, uh, you need to always watch for the uh, pressure or the back pressure of the whole system. Um, look at the elution peak. You want it to be optimized um, as short as possible, as long as it's necessary. Okay, and of course, the background uh, signal to noise, as you've seen previously. Uh, if you choose a two twenty to 30 nanometer um, nanometer detector, you do see an increase in signal to noise uh, of your background. Okay, so those are these are the things that you need to take into consideration. Then proceed with method validation. Okay, so method validation is basically you just rerun it a few times to ensure that you get a similar results. As long as you get the similar results, then you have validated your data, your, your method. So, and finally, you need to make sure that you keep all data for future reference. Because again, if you are doing a, a quantitative uh, method analysis, then um, comparison to a previous run is always best. Okay, that is all for me. Uh, we do have about eight minutes left. Um, so I'll just post this tutorial question for you guys now. Um, take a screenshot um, and uh, as usual, um, submit to uh, via Spectrum, okay? Mm, even though I know you guys will start your alternative assessment at 730 today, but it doesn't mean that you need to either start it, that one straight away or this one straight away. It's up to you. You do have um, this one because it is during the lecture time. So I hope that you can just quickly um, finish this and submit it so that you can focus on trying to figure out what will be the best answer for your alternative assessment. Okay, so that is all from me. And of course, this one is very easy, very straightforward. In your own words, write a design of a theoretical setup, HPLC, method development for the compound, this one. Okay, so you do have a lot of double bonds. Um, so it's very straightforward. All right, so that is all from me for today. Um, I will post the... Um, your last lecture notes, um, hopefully by uh, Sunday. Uh, I've already completed about 90% of it. I just need, uh, I want to add more examples on um, how do you troubleshoot HPLC, especially because you will not have any other um, assessment, well, at least for this course. I'm not sure about for the other course, but at least for this course, you will not have any other assessment. So on week 14, it will be solely on the... Um, this lecture and yep, that is all. Okay, thank you and um, I'll stay safe and good luck with your um, alternative assessment. Doctor? Yes? Uh, regarding the tutorial, so we have to mention what column, detector, the solvent that you use? Yep. Okay, just do a theoretical um, scenario. Lah. Okay, so to say. Okay, Doctor. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor.